Welcome back, guys. It was Classico Sunday, and boy, did Real Madrid take advantage of Classico Sunday. I'm here with Oscar and with Taps, and we're going to dig right into this. And I'm going to start with you, Taps, because as a Real Madrid fan who has experienced Xavi, Iniesta, and Busquets Boston midfield, this must have felt really great for you because Real Madrid were running circles around Barcelona at times, it seemed, in the midfield. Yeah, it felt it felt really good, especially for the first like 50 to 60 minutes. I can actually comfortably say that I don't think we've been that comfortable in a classic or ever. Not since that I can remember, at least not since like before the 2010s. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's funny you mentioned the word comfort because watching this game, it felt like Madrid, they just, they had control. They were never, even when Barcelona had the ball, because like if you look at the stats, Barcelona had more shots, more passes, somewhat more possession, but Madrid were just comfortable with it. They just knew if we attack, we'll score. Did you get that feeling? Yeah, pretty much. And Tony Cruz today, my word, he was on his game. Everything was telepathic with Modric. And again, like you said, uh, the word being comfortable, because even though Barcelona was getting chances here and there, they had position, they were building up, they never really felt like a threat until late on in the game. Yeah. I'm going to have to eat my own papaya here because on this podcast, I've not been friendly towards Tony Cross, but he had he had a party last today. He controlled the midfield. He was stringing along Barcelona. Some of the moves he made, I'm like, is this Cross? <laughs> I didn't see him play like this for a long time. Yeah, it was as if he aged like at least 10 years younger. And yeah, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm actually very happy because I think when we spoke about the pregame, this 11 that Carlo put out is the exact 11 that I'd actually spoken to Oscar about that I wanted to see. Because although people want to see Rodrigo start, they want to see Rudiger start, I think for big games this season, this is our gala 11. And Kroos and Modric will start the games, control the tempo. And then late on in the games, when there's now a bit more open, it's a bit more chaotic, then we bring on your Camavingas, your Rodrigos into the game. But yeah. Tony Cruz today was was on it. Yeah, but one person who was without doubt the man of the match was Federico Valverde. Tony Cruz made a tweet that is top three in the world right now. Is that just smoke or is there truth in it? Uh, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, as a Madridista, I would love to to hype it up, but I think uh, expectations need to be tempered with Fede because. Like we never used to give him enough credit, I think we also shouldn't similarly give him too much credit. But but it deserves the credit though, because in the Madrid derby, he was there. He's involved in the play that leads to the first goal. He scores the second goal here. He scores the second goal, and he's involved in the play that leads to the penalty. So he's proven to be big in this big games. And if you look back into the Champions League final, he gives a run that gives that assist. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, the amount of big games that he's shown up in, I've genuinely actually lost count in. And I think he's also been a big part in being able to prolong the longevity of Cruz and Modric to, to coexist in the midfield. Like like we discussed before when I was on the pod again, that position that he plays where he's sort of like a right midfielder, right winger, but he just drifts everywhere across the pitch. And having Fede on that side of the pitch with Carvajal being able to overlap as well just gives so much trouble to teams left back it's hard to contain him yeah and for Real Madrid it's almost like they are a chameleon in a way because they can play in a way that okay they can play that fast counter-attacking game they can play the ticky tacky passing game and also they can also like sit back and defend so it's almost a difficult team to get your nose around because they can beat you in so many ways and does Carlo Ancelotti get as much credit for his tactical flexibility as much as showing this season because I think this is possibly the best Carlo Ancelotti I've seen in almost a decade. Yeah, I think people are coming around now. Last season, we saw them get a little bit annoyed at the lack of rotations, um, the constant like uh, senior players being run into the ground. And I think Carlo himself also learned to lesson because we saw in the second half of the season, that's when he started rotating a lot more. He was giving uh, like not only just the substitutions of Camavinga and Rodrigo and everything, but he showed a bit of tactical flexibility. And I think going into this season, like he said at the very beginning of the season, he he learned to do better. And he challenged uh, Fede to get double-digit goals. He challenged Rodrigo to get double-digit goals. And I think 
now we're being able to see the benefits of like the calming presence that Carlo is not just um, in terms of motivating the team and keeping a, a locker room together, but also tactically on the pitch. He knows how to adapt to different game states. And that's something that people have never really given him credit for. Cause whilst he's not like a, a manager that has, you know, like a set philosophy, set tactic, he sort of just knows how to adapt uh, to different opponents and just go with the flow, regardless yeah. who, who the opponent coming at him is. Yeah, that, that's a great point because it really annoyed me after the Champions League final when this guy has won the Champions League and you used to have people saying, what does Carlo Ancelotti actually do? It's just luck, it's just holding hands. But clearly, for a guy who's won four Champions Leagues, I believe, yeah. you must people have... People view him out. as the, you know, like a kumbaya manager. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, so should we go to the bad of the class, though? We're going to start with you, Oscar, because... Boy, <laughs> this has been some week for Barcelona. It's been it's been horrendous. Yeah, yeah, horrendous, pathetic, stupid, useless. I can think of so many words to describe this week, but yeah, today was today. I mean, I expected us to lose, but today was honestly not good at all. Like you guys said before, Real Madrid are a team that can hurt teams so many ways. That's why I think when I was previewing this game with two of you, I was like. Possession is key because at, even Madrid have so many gifted players. It's not like the classicals of the 2000s where they just let Barcelona have the ball. Now they have Cruz, Modric, Fede, guys that can really hurt you in possession. So, you know, I see it as this. Real Madrid can hurt you by counter-attacking you, by sitting deep, and by just outplaying you. Pick your poison instead of allowing them to do everything. You get... Tactically, it was... I don't get what Javi's do. I don't, know, I don't get what's in Javi's TD this because I don't understand why Real Madrid players were just allowed to do whatever they wanted. No one was pressing. No one was getting close. Like it's like the way you guys said, every shot from Real Madrid felt like a goal because they had all the time in the world to think about where am I going to put this? How fast am I going to do this? They were faster, not just physically, but in their minds, the way they played. We were the complete opposite. And then when we get our big chances, we don't take them. Can, can I Keep... say something about Barcelona? Because in no, that no. first half, I feel Barcelona didn't show up. At they, all. they didn't make it a game. Like, there wasn't that intense pressing, no. that closing down. No. And I wonder whether it's because Gavi wasn't there. Because when Gavi came on, no. he brought in a different energy, like an energy that was competitive for the for a classical. Well, exactly. Busquets didn't have that. Frankie de Jong did his best, but I feel in that midfield there was something wrong. And the wingers, they were terrible today. Uh, I'm getting to that. Yeah, I feel not starting Gavi in a game because in games like this, Gavi brings that energy, that press, on, along with the creativity and talent. And then here's the main problem I've noticed with Barcelona: Javi's Barcelona, their biggest weakness. We rely on wing play too much. And wing play relies on your wingers being good and being confident, right? Yeah. When your wingers are neither good, confident, and to be honest, are just trash at the moment, <laughs> your whole system is it's like every, Real Madrid had many ways to create chances. All I was looking at was like, okay, we're trying to cross the ball for the 100 bloody time. So that Lewandowski can try and head it. And like, are we Stoke City or something? <laughs> like honestly, we need to. I mean, I'm not saying Javi out or anything like the guys on Twitter are saying, but he's a young manager, he has to learn, right? Like Carlo Ancelotti learned and is a better man for it. Yeah. Javi needs to learn too because Carlo schooled him today. Yeah, yeah he needs he needs to I, yeah. I don't remember the last time a Real Madrid team dominated us like this. I feel like that if I'm to feel embarrassed, that's the one thing I'll feel embarrassed by because we did not show up. What we're good at, we didn't even try it at all. We're just trying to be, so we're just relying on players that are just not confident at the moment. So, yeah, Javi needs to change stuff. Rant over. But, but after the thing is, you're right about the win confidence because I watched Barca in the game against Inter Milan, and we'll get onto that. But it felt like Rafinha couldn't cross the ball to save his life. No. Um, in this game, a couple of corners from Rafinha goes nowhere. <laughs> Also in the Inter game. 
And also an Inter game. Ansufati and Ferran come on and they combine really well. Ansufati does really well for that goal. Why hasn't Xavi been playing Ansufati? Because he seems like one of the few Barca players up top with an actual goal threat. Yeah, that's the thing. I know that we're managing because of injury history, but even still, I've always said the optimal wing combinations, partner Lewandowski, is either Dembele and Rafinha and either Fati or Ferran because Dembele and Rafinha are the same team. They do the same team. Yeah. Fati and Rafinha do something different. So I'm like, rather than just playing the same types of players at the same time, why not mix it up? Because if you notice throughout the game, if you notice something about Barcelona, the players are too far away from each other. Yeah. How, if, if, can you think of how many times Fre Pedri and Frankie, the two number eights, combined with each other today? I can barely think of any, besides maybe hugging each other in the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> um, the wingers, Dembele, I know Dembele tried to do to correct this by cutting inside, but that's not really his game. So when Ferran and Fati came on, they did that well. They combined it well, and those can our central threat was better. And I feel, you know, if we're change, if you're changing something, if you're not calling anyone because the team, we're in this together. We're bad together, we're good together. There's no scapegoats in 18 year, except for one person I'm going to scapegoat. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, at this point, I feel a change is needed in the wings. Just if, for, if not for anything, but to give Rafinha and Dembele some confidence back because you can only, if you're trying to play yourself out, out of a rut, sometimes it's doing more harm than good. Yeah, that's true. And so should we talk on the controversies in this game? And I'm going to start with the first penalty on Lewandowski. Do you guys think, or non-penalty call? Do you guys no, think it's not a penalty. penalty. Not a penalty. Nope. Minimal contact. Minimal contact. Taps? Yeah, I, I wouldn't give it, but I can, I've, I've seen them give it before. Yeah. And that's it. I can imagine yeah. Barcelona fans were angry because Rodrigo's penalty was called. And you can also say it's the slightest of contact, but it is like a step on the toe. So, yeah, that sounds definitely sounds like more of a penalty than the Lewandowski one because that's that's the clear definition of a penalty. So, and they said they're not giving those, so I didn't see any reason to complain, honestly. Yeah. yeah, for me, similarly, I wouldn't have given the Rodrigo one as well. I would have. It's not like he would have scored the penalty. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barcelona players better not watch this podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but to, to be fair, Lewandowski did show up in the big game. He showed up against Inter Milan. He scored two goals to make it 3 3. Too little, too late, though. So, yeah, too little, too late. Barcelona yeah, I was going to out. say, he scored two goals after missing a few good chances. <laughs> But, but um, Oscar, Barca, they made a big deal of these levers that Barcelona are back. They're going to be for everything. <laughs> and in this week, it's <laughs> against Inter Milan. You would expect them to... Back Inter, to reality. Yeah, yeah. Because Inter, they're not, they're not like really doing that well in Serie A. So like, you would expect them to, do, to win at least. But I mean, we were winning until somebody thought everything was all right, <laughs> and then everything was not all... Like, I, like, you were an experienced guy. If Eric did that, I'd understand, not you. I have other things to say, but they're not podworthy. So, anyways, like, we're, once again, we are the creators of our own downfall with mistakes, with bad tactics, with bad player selections. That said... I don't think I don't think we should write off the season or anything. It's not that but there's a champion situation is not ideal, but in the league it's not that bad. Granted, what the people say are the best equipped thing to stop Real Madrid, and we failed to do that, but we're still in a good position as long as we don't let this bad mentality go on. Because you know how Barcelona can be sometimes when they have one bad result, they they. They still over it for too long, in yeah. my opinion. So against Villarreal on Wednesdays, it just gets back the right mentality. And for a Champions League, unless Inter does a favor, I, I already see where I'm already out. So <laughs> there's nothing to talk about there again. Just, I mean, while it was a tough group and we had some stupid decisions against us, 
it's this this um, Champions League campaign and this week as a whole showed Javi still has a lot to grow to grow into, but the potential is there. He just has to learn like his superiors did. Will, will, so, you, get the, will you get the patience though? Because Barca mm. have the Real Athletic Club and Valencia who have been doing quite well in La Liga. And if the results don't go their way, like do you think Laporta maybe panics? Uh, I don't think he'll panic or anything. I also yeah I also don't think like we're at the point of questioning Javi's job yet. Like we're far from it. So yeah. uh, if we get if we get bad results, I'll still stick with him to the end of the season or whatever because the guy is learning on the job basically. He just has to stop doing the mistakes he has been doing and grow. Yeah. Taps from an outside the perspective, what do you say will be Barca's biggest problem at the moment? Uh, for me, I think touching back on the, the game against Inter, I think even though I wanted Barcelona to lose that game, the thing that disappointed me the most was how naive they were in the second half of the game. Because once you, in a Champions League game, once you take control and you go into the half leading, you need to come out strong. You can't come out and like completely looking lost and just I don't know like Oscar already touched on it the way that they started that second half was just it was very sloppy and I don't know if it's to blame fully on the players or the manager because I was about to say like we saw in some of the games in La Liga as well Xavi has shown a bit of naivety but I guess he's still learning so I think it might hold them back a little bit this season um, depending on how he approaches this month, especially, and the remaining of the big games. I think Barca need to start taking charge of games a little bit more than they are right now. Yeah, because the lack of control today was just not good. And it's, we saw the same thing against Celta. And I don't know if he needs to change someone in the midfield or anything. Because you think for control purposes that Frankie Young is better than Gavi in that sense. That's why I understood making that change. But so, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's why I wanted Bernard the Silva so badly. <laughs> but but why, why don't you play someone like Frank Kessie, right? Because you get that, like, guy in Metro who can win battles. Uh, honestly, that's another change. I, I wouldn't be mad at seeing. Because I feel against Villarreal, I'm not scared of anyone, but some players need to be put out of a firing line <laughs> before they get into a bad frame of mind and lose confidence totally. Yeah. yeah, and touching back on what Oscar also mentioned about the different combinations of wingers, I think there's different games that Xavi's going to need different situations. And exactly. I don't think he's using the squad to the best of its ability at the moment. Especially yeah. Kessie, again, Kessie is another example where there's games when you're going to need Kessie versus yeah. control. And you'll need to sacrifice that control in the midfield of holding possession to be able to bring in that dominant midfielder who's... Kind of like, and I, I've used this example before, kind of like how Valverde used Paulinho during his time at Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how I think Xavi should be using Kessie. Yeah, I, I really feel against Enter Kessie should have been used. Uh, like, if you're going to play with Busquets there, like, you should play with Kessie to bring it out, especially to protect a weak back line. I feel that's where you really needed him. But anyways... <laughs> Enough talk on Barcelona and Madrid. Let's move on to the other classic game, Athletic versus Atletico. And uh, Oscar, our friend, was refereeing this game and he had a nightmare. Yeah, Mr. Figueroa Vasquez yeah. thought Renil the committed a handball and the ball <laughs> hits his head and he's unmentionable. So I'm like, why? On top of that, there are other decisions in the game that just yeah. didn't make sense. Yeah, the Morata one blows my mind. I was watching this with someone who doesn't watch any soccer and they were surprised that like Morata's goal is disallowed because he barely pushes Yerai. Yerai falls naturally and I'm like, this is a goal, right? It looked like Yerai tripped himself. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was the thing, honestly. <laughs> but aside from the controversy, this I, I feel this is Atletico going back to the classic. Their roots. Atletico, their mm-hmm. roots. It's just like, we're just going to score and we're just going to defend really well and renew yeah. goal did an amazing job like the mm-hmm. blocks he put in he was condobia was great in, like helping defense and it, it was a it was a sweet win for them yeah jose maria jimenez as well my friends who used to play for fight me likes his name 
it was really good too. And I want to shout out one person. Garbage was insane when he came on. Oh, yeah. It was athletic. Definitely had chances to score an equalizer. Well, Garbage denied them. Renewed the renied, put everything on the line to deny them. And yeah, it was really like the, the typical throwback athletic performance. They only had one good opportunity in the game minus the ones that were ruled out and Griezmann took it. Yeah. And Athletic, I mean, they, while you can say it's Athletic, this is story of Athletic Club not taking their chances again. I thought Athletic, they, that kind of defending is hard to score against. You can't really blame yourself. Yeah. And, and Athletic, they, in recent years, they haven't really done well at Sam It's the first time they've been there since 2022. Uh, Taps, how big of a win is this for them? I think for Atleti, this will be a very big win. Like you said, it was them going back to basics, going back to what Cholo's known for. We haven't seen them have a defensive performance like this in a long time. They've looked always shaky again, looking like... Because there's a difference when you're defending with control and, again, defending where you're being forced into defending because the other team is being so dominant. But I think this was uh, another vintage Atleti performance. Morata was looking sharp. Uh, the cutback for the Griezmann goal was really good. Griezmann himself, again, is also starting to look like Griezmann of old. I think after the game, he issued an apology as well to the mm. Ultra Nero fans about the whole Barca thing and whatnot. So hopefully that um, Atleti are able to get the old Griezmann back as well. Yeah, and I want to jump onto Athletic Club. But before that, let's talk about Atleti in the Champions League because I felt they were very good against Club Brugge on Tuesday. And but it's just they had they had so many chances they couldn't score to save their lives. They're in this difficult situation in the group, but unlike Barcelona, it's in their own hands. Mm-hmm. Are you? How do you feel they will do in this group? Do you feel they have what it takes to come out of the group? They have like when the group itself came out, we said we all said they have what it takes to easily win the group. It's just that they like making life difficult for themselves. <laughs> that said, it is in their own hands. I think. The Brugge, the Brugge game was good. It's just that Minnie was a monster in goal. And if they play like that against Bayer Leverkusen and I think they beat them. And then Porto, if you go to Porto and then to a Brugge, take care of Bayer Leverkusen, I think they'll be fine. <laughs> they have to go back to Porto again, where they went to last season. And that win, that was super controversial. Lots of And dramatic. <laughs> yeah. It's typical Atletico Madrid. They don't do things in a simple way. <laughs> and, and Taps, do you think they would like find a way to snick themselves into the last 16 of Champions League? Yeah, I think I think they'll find a way through. Again, like Oscar mentioned, I think Brugge will help them because Brugge should win their remaining games as well. And that'll give Atleti a platform to just have to basically beat Leverkusen and then not lose to Porto. Sure. So, and moving back to La Liga with Athletic, is the Valverde effect just an easy schedule? Because they played Sevilla, who have improved under San Paoli a bit. They played Atletico, and they've only scored one goal in both games. Mm. They played good enough. They, it's not like they played badly. It's just, I feel, against teams that are of the same level as you and that time you so your limitations will get shown more. So they're having a good season. It's just for them to take that next step, they need to do better in these games. Yeah. I feel like the Sevilla one was a missed opportunity because of how Sevilla are. Yeah, I don't think they've necessarily been bad in the big games. Mm-hmm. They've underperformed, but it's not really something they should worry about yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's going to be a tough race for them between in, in the Champions League. Betis right now, they're in the top four. I really enjoyed the game against Almeria because I felt it felt like a proper derby. Almeria going for it, Betis going for it. Some quality goals. How good is Bora Iglesias and Alex Moreno? Because sometimes when I watch Alex Moreno, it feels like Roberto Carlos. Yeah, go on, Tops. Yeah, I was about to say Panda. Panda can't be stopped from scoring. No. He's just, I don't know, I've actually lost words. And again, he's also made me eat my words. Because again, I, I didn't think he was actually ever going to be this good ever since he left uh, Espanol. But it's good to see them scoring. It's good to see Betis playing really well. 
Uh, I think Joaquin was playing in the 10 role today. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. And Carvalho as well getting on the score sheet. Uh, overall, good game from them. Almeria did play well as well. I don't think they deserved to necessarily lose by the amount they lost by, but they were very poor in the second half. Oh, they were. And that second half, it's, it's crazy because it, it felt like they started really well. They got the goal back, but then they just collapsed in those 10 minutes. And that's the thing about football. You can be as good as you want to be, but it's a game of moments, and Betis picked the moments really well. Yeah, especially with the Borja goal and the second William Carvalho goal coming so close to each other. That really can knock the stuffing out of anything, and Almeria felt that effect. So all the good things they did throughout the game were right, off and not at the end. Yeah, at least the score now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Bilal, I, I think it's good that Bilal Turi has scored again because it's good that it's good to have someone who looks reliable in front of Gula and can replace Sadiq. Yeah, because Baptiste and Sosa, I don't, I don't think they're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they're right. Bilal is the guy, and maybe, um, is it Lorenzo Lautaro? I, I forgot his name. Oh, but the num- they're number 14. Vinicius Lautaro. Yeah, Vinicius, yeah. Yeah, and Real Sociedad, good luck to them. They're, they're having no problem scoring right now. Like, the last season was one year to the Real Sociedad, but now they can actually score more than one goal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really... Real Sociedad, I think they've won seven games in the row in all competitions, and this is their best ever run since the 50s. You know, and it's not just Sorlo that's scoring. You have Bryce chipping with a good amount of goals. You have Kubo scoring, Ilara Mendy even scoring now for the first time <laughs> since the 1819 season. Now, granted, he's been out injured for most of that time, but it was it was nice to see him back on the score sheet and happy again. And Russo said they've really done well to qualify for the round of, for round of 16 so far. And in their group, if they can get first, it's even better so you can avoid a big team coming from the Champions League. Yeah. And what I what I like about them this season is that it feels that they are much more comfortable playing in Europe and in La Liga, which we yeah. haven't seen in the past two seasons. Mm-hmm. I think back to how they did against Manchester United. They did very well. They took it very professionally. If you think of the past where they've, they've gone and played United and they've lost by like four goes to zero, <laughs> it's definitely a big improvement from them. Yeah. Emmanuel was a bit naive in that occasion, but he's learned his lesson now. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you guys think about Valencia's chances of sneaking into the European picture? Last week, it looked very good. This week, it still it still looks good because Cavani is getting off the mark. It's just that not beating Elche as the end uh, kind of feels like a missed opportunity, especially at home. Yeah. Although you can say maybe this is a new manager bounce, right, Taps? Uh, Amiron came in, Elche were more brave. Mm-hmm. Paramia was as annoying as ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, new manager bounce. Yeah, <laughs> I think I wouldn't necessarily say it's a new manager bounce because necessarily Elche have just been terrible at the beginning of the season uh, compared to how they were playing last season and Again, I think they will start to do a little better, and Edgar Badia deserves a lot better than what his defense has been giving him this season. Honestly. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it was a good performance again. Uh, Mia with a brace, I think, and then Cavani also with a brace. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the two strikers going against each other. And touching on Valencia as well, I think the European spots may be a step too far for Valencia, but I think they'll, they'll go for it for sure. And has Gattuso's performance in La Liga surprised you? Because you know about him from his time in Milan. Oh, yeah. He definitely surprised me. Because I think even at the beginning of the season when we spoke about it, I mentioned that be prepared to you know, have a lot of games where you suffer <laughs> the, the, the Cholo Simeone tag. Because in, in Milan and Napoli, we saw uh, Gattuso teams never really take control. They were always sort of like on the back foot and just punching back and, you know, getting results, but we never really saw them have really good performances. And I think that's something that's been different 
with this Valencia side. His Valencia side looks a lot better. It kind of resembles his first Milan side. So when you, uh, I think it was like the first three months or four months of Milan. That's the sort of vibe that I'm getting from this Valencia team. Yes. Yeah. And let's move on to Sevilla, who seem to be getting their form back with Jorge Sampaoli. They won one nil courtesy of a Golasso by good day. <laughs> I, I didn't know he had that in him. Me neither. <laughs> Uh, it was a truly great goal, uh, but a lot of the results are getting better, yeah. and they've gotten their first clean yeah, sheets. Yeah. Like exactly what I was going to say. It's like Sevilla so took the athletic approach for this one, and it's worked. It's almost as if they have a new strong center back who can lead the line very well. Mm. Yeah, who would have thought? Not me. <laughs> And so yeah, they have Valencia and Real Madrid coming up this week. In the Champions League, they got that they got a good draw at Phil and Dortmund, but it's not enough for them. They're possibly going to go out. But in the league, what should we expect from them in the next couple of games where they're going to face really tough opponents? I think I think against Valencia, Valencia will be the protagonist in the game, but we can see, depending on what Sampali's lineup is, because some of his tactics have confused me. <laughs> but de- depending on what he does, I feel they have a good chance against Valencia, but against Real Madrid, yeah, no. yeah. you saw what happened today, didn't you? No one can <laughs> stop them. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no one can really stop them. If, if Sevilla are the ones to stop them, it will just be, I'll just laugh because it will just be funny. <laughs> It took a miracle. Like, like on Sampali, on his tactics in Dortmund, I was so pissed off because <laughs> I, I felt he could have gone for the game. I know, I know it's like it's a new team. You don't want to like break confidence, but if it's 1 1, you have a chance to go through. Why not go for it? Why not? But if he, instead, he just to take off all the strikers, play as close as a false nine, and pretty much kill the game from there. Yeah, that's what I said. That confused me, and then to start like that against Mallorca utterly confused me too. You have, you have three number nines. I mean, I guess he saw Pep succeed without a number nine. He's like maybe that will work. <laughs> he ain't that guy though. He ain't that guy. He's not. He's not that. He's not that bulky. No. <laughs> no. Uh, let's go to the last two games that we saw this weekend: Girona, Cadiz. There was a weird on goal that was disallowed in this one. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, but it's like Cadiz player is like going back and he bicycle kicks yeah. it back into his own. The, like, overhead kicked into his own goal. I think they, they disallowed it for like a, a shirt pull or something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would have been fun if it actually stood. Because <laughs> it, it was it definitely people who post it around then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually thought it should have stood because, like, the, the shirt pull didn't look like it affected him because he was falling down already. Exactly. So, but yeah. I, I don't know. I didn't look at it too closely. Like, how did they start picking up points? But it feels like them, Elche, and Valladolid are the three that are going to go down. Yeah, it seems like it's, it's funny because, like you said, Cad is unbe- unbeaten in like four games now, but. We haven't seen enough in those four games to suggest that they have the necessary firepower to stay up. And the one thing about Cadet is they, I don't feel they have that presence that can lead them away from relegation zone. Like Rayo, they have Falcao and Robert Tomas come in. Mallorca have Moriki. Cadet, there's no quality in this team. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's such a truth. Alex Fernandez, and that's about it. Yeah. Even even Alex hasn't been that good this season. Yeah, he scored yeah. his first goal this weekend, but he's mostly he's been scrappy as well. Yeah, <laughs> typical <laughs> Cadiz. Yeah. yeah, and speaking about like players who are X factors, Espanol they have Rosello. So even though we expected big things from Espanol, they've not really started well. But when you have a striker like Rosello who scored six plus goals in the league already. You're yeah, I think he's tied. He should be tied with Pablo. He's tied with Borja. If Bor- Borja has seven, I think. Yeah. Borja has seven and Pasa has seven. I think Aspas has six or five. Yeah, six. Yeah. But but it's that it's that thing with Espanols because you expected more from them given the fact mm-hmm. they have one of the best managers 
below, let's say, the top six or seven in La Liga? Mm-hmm. My thing is that you have to remember their summer window is exactly what they thought it would be, and the squad is kind of because the squad doesn't have enough senior players and has maybe more youth players posing as senior players. If posing sounds harsh, but being uh, being called to be up to be senior players as against other teams because they just didn't prepare the end of the window well. Still, yeah. they made good enough signings in someone like Brian Olivan who has chipped in with a few assists, someone like Vinicius Souza who has been pretty solid. It's just, yeah, given everything, we do, we do have a right to expect more from Espanyol. Yeah, we do. And finally, the battle to see who the third best team in Madrid ended. <laughs> As a show, Hetafe, no interest at all in attacking. <laughs> it was it, yeah. And we had a, a, another penalty save, and it was David Soria. But in the same game, David Surya made a stupid mistake that was fortunately ruled off. <laughs> like the commentator was watching and said that David Surya is a high and lose goalkeeper. <laughs> and I laughed so much because it's actually true. This guy, this season, has done the best and then the absolute worst at times. Oh, man, his performance in Mestaya was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's him at his worst. But then against Villarreal, in, against them, um, and Ryu, he was absolutely brilliant. Right, yeah. So, like, Taps, we have a new segment on this podcast since you since you last came. So, who do you think the best team has been for this week? And who is the best player? Uh, best team, I would probably have to give it to maybe Betis. Betis? Yeah. If I had to go for the best team and the best player, I will go with Tony Cross. Tony Cross, interesting. Oscar, I'll go with Tony Cross to like that guy was something else to be. <laughs> I, I was shocked. I was like, is this Cruz? Yeah. <laughs> the guy was, the guy was dribbling past Rafinha, dribbling past everyone. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? It, he ran it back, man. He ran yeah, it he back. he really ran it back. And yeah, I, I give it to Cruz, and. The best team I also give it to Real Madrid because yeah. to, because it's an important game you have to win against your big rival and you're first now with three points. Although three points is nothing at this point of the season, but to be the way you're playing, that three points is going to probably stay there for a while. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with you and I'll say the best team is Real Madrid, but I'll be slightly different in my best player. I'm gonna go for Valverde. Oh, nice. Still a Real Madrid player. Yeah, still, still a Real Madrid player. Like, <laughs> but, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying. It's like, oh, yeah, we we can't like at the moment, right? They yeah. are the best team by a mile in Spain. That's the truth. At the moment, but let's let's move on to the rest of Europe. There was the big game today. Also, was Liverpool Manchester City. Liverpool they destroyed Rangers in midweek. They come into this game and they win one zero. What's the crisis in Liverpool? They're scoring goals, they're winning big games. Nothing's wrong. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they lost a big game the week before, but they seem to have turned, got into really huge results in terms of Champions League qualification. And I don't know what the aspirations are in the league now, but they have the, we are the first team to stop City Trophy, so that's nice. <laughs> okay, but my nose joke, Liverpool really approached this game well and had a lot of chances to score a second and even a third goal, which are probably left club pulling his hair out. But if you're a Liverpool fan, you can't have asked for a better week. Yeah. And I want to talk about Chelsea too, because they, they seem to be having a very good time under Graham Potter. Uh, Taps, what, what happened in the chelsea Milan game? Was it just Magic Mike was in there or what did Chelsea do differently? Nah, Chelsea approached that game really professionally, and again, yeah, Milan as a whole, although there's players missing, they can't really use that as an excuse for for such a naive performance uh, in mm-hmm. Europe. And I'm not too sure why Milan keeps having these sort of naive performances, because we saw again last season uh, when they were in the group with Atleti and Liverpool, they churned out these performances where one week they look like they could win the group and then another week they're just 
looking completely terrible and in both instances they're not really getting the points over the line but for some reason then they go back to the league and they they get it done but yeah for europe it's looking like another another year of europa i I think last season they didn't even make it out yeah because that group was really tough yeah but but i'll say milan they have a they have a chance in this one because if they beat salzburg and maybe and they would have to hope that chelsea does their job against salzburg then they could go through. Yeah, they can, but I'm I'm worried that Salzburg is going to beat Milan. <laughs> I'm very worried about that. Well, oh, you have little faith. Have faith in your club. <laughs> faith in your club. Oh. Uh, keep your expectations low, so you won't be disappointed <laughs> after it's work today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they they did make you sweat a bit today when they were playing Verona, didn't they? Yeah, today was one of those. It was sort of like a routine win. I was actually laughing about this, I think, including all of the big teams, Juve, Atalanta, everyone just sort of had routine wins where they didn't really look that good, but they just got the results uh, over the line. And I think there was, what, two own goals in this game as well? Uh, Tonali channeling. I don't know why Tonali scored so many goals against Verona. I think last season he scored a brace against them as well. So he set up, he actually started the goal. Uh, in the build-up, played it to Leao, Leao played it to uh, Rebic, and then Tonali made the run, the late run into the box, and got the goal. So, yeah, routine victory. It was a bit of a, eh, one of those games where they didn't really play that well, but they, they just had to get the result. Yeah, I want to talk about Juve for a second, because they're in big trouble in their group in Champions League. The, Juve the... should have fired Allegri a month ago. But who did they bring to replace him? At this point, uh, it's better to have an interim manager bring in True. whoever you need to because right now they're risking not only getting knocked out in the Champions League group, but they're also risking their top four position in the league. Yeah. And in terms of, I'm, I'm going to transition to Inter. How big of a win was that? Or I'm sorry, how big of a result was that getting that point at Camry for Inter going forward? Because we, we've gotten this theme of Inter in the Champions League of being, I hate to use the word, butlers in the group stage, given what's yeah. happened in the past. But it seems like this time they've grown, they've experienced, they've experienced more things. And if they do get over the line, how big of it will be, of a statement would that be for Inzaghi, given what's happening in Serie A? Oh, the result at company was massive for them, especially like we saw Alatara hadn't scored in like eight games, scored against Barca, Scored a banger again this weekend. Barella also on the score sheet this weekend for, for Inter as well. And I think, like you said, that result will do a lot of good because prior to actually Inter uh, meeting Barca in the two legs, there was actually like thoughts that Inzaghi should be fired. There was murmurs that you know his job is under pressure and all that. And now all of a sudden, he's just turned everything around. They're looking a little comfortable now performance-wise in the league. So I think... Um, if they do end up making it through, that result at the company was going to be very big for their season. Yeah, yeah. and Inter, Simone Inzaghi after the game said that Barcelona won't forget Inter after, the, after that game. <laughs> and they certainly won't. Uh, crossing over to Germany, Bayern Munich, they got a big win against Freiburg. But the big story in the Bundesliga right now is Union Berlin. They beat Dortmund and they're still top of the table. By four points out of Bayern. That's insane. They absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's really good to see, honestly. I just hope they keep it up. But, you know, it, it's hard to, it's too, I think it's always too much to ask for them. You know, as, as football fans, and especially fans of Union Berlin, like dreaming is free. So, at the very least, if you can get a top four spot, I think that'll be absolutely successful. Yeah. And what about on the flip side for Dortmund Tap? Because, I know they're in a group of Sevilla. We don't think Sevilla are going to go through, but there's a there are permutations and there's a world in which Dortmund bottled the last two games. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Sevilla yeah, especially through. Dortmund. Knowing yeah, if they that. lose to Man City and don't beat Copenhagen, then they're out. If that's if Sevilla do their job. Yeah, and what, what would I say about the this, this season with Terzic? Because this is a season where Bayern Munich have not been they've not gotten the results we expect them to get yeah they're not on fine on all cylinders Dortmund should be there 
yeah, this is one of those seasons where Dortmund should be doing a lot better. And, of course, again, it is a new squad. We have a lot of new signings uh, early on in the season, especially. Basically, all the signings were injured except uh, Schlotterbeck. And now that all the signings are back, the team should really be performing a lot better. And the one thing that's confusing is it's hard to tell if it's like a tactical issue or a personnel issue. I think Terzic is, you know, it was a bit of a risky, a risky hire. Uh, it was a sentimental hire <laughs> from Dortmund because I think given where the team was in this position, all the new signings wanting to actually challenge Bayern, they should have gone for a more experienced manager in this situation. Again, not to take anything away from Terzic because he did really well uh, in his stint as interim manager, but I think much like the situation with Xavi in Barcelona, it's a little too early for for you know for the team for Terzic in the situation. Yeah. And how good is Jude Bellingham? Because he's scoring goals for fun in the Champions League. He's he's not gonna be there for very long, is he? Uh with Bellingham it's a bit confusing because I think out of all like the young young players that Dortmund was able to invest in, I think Bellingham might actually be the one that stays beyond the time that we actually expect him to. Even though I know next season all the sharks are going to be circling and Liverpool, Madrid, everyone is pretty much going to be ready to uh, to pay his release clause. But I think he might actually stay at Dortmund for maybe like a season or two longer than normal. He's been really good for them and he has like a surprisingly good attachment with the fans, with the locker room. Like he's showing like leadership skills that we haven't seen in a youngster since maybe the lick that I think. Yeah. Another star in the Bundesliga who's doing really well in the Champions League is Leroy Sané. And I've been super impressed with this guy. Like in the game against Inter, the game against Barcelona, even in the Clasico, I believe he scored last week as well. So mm-hmm. it, he's turned the situation around at Bayern. Yeah, he's really grown his stature this season. And he's looking like... I want to say leader, leader attack might be too much since a lot of people are stepping up in the absence of Lewandowski, but he's really making a case to be Bayern's best attacker this year. Yeah. And as someone who likes Sonny a lot from his shocker, it's really nice to see him do well now. Yeah, it, it is indeed. Let's transition over to the French League and those another big game, PSG versus Marseille. Mbappe was the big story given what we heard before the Champions League game. He gave an assist to Neymar. There were hugs, there were kisses. All is well in Paris, right? I think all is well. I, I don't know. Rumors at this point, I take them into an absolute grain of salt because you have one reliable source saying it's all a lie. You have another reliable source saying he wants to go, he's made a mistake, this, that. And like, I feel, I, I feel Mbappe at this moment. Or like what everyone thinks about is just focused on doing as well as he can this season. And yeah, I don't think they're struggling in Paris yet. Taps, will you, if we be calling for in Paris to maybe have a punt? Uh... The <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mbappe jersey is still printed there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I think like Oscar was saying, I think it's a it's a whole lot of more smoke than there actually is substance to the rumors. But I do think there is substance in the sense that we always kind of knew that his extension with PSG was not really, you know, like a long term solution. It's just a short term. <laughs> let's see what happens, kind of thing. Like I think he was going to commit to them for maybe two years, see if they can win the Champions League. If they win it either this year or next year, I think he still ends up leaving at that point in time. But where he ends up going, I'm not too sure. Uh, Because we do know uh, a lot of Madrid fans don't really like him anymore. But I'm on the opposite of that because I still think he'd be a really good piece in our attack. And I don't really care too much about the whole drama thing. Uh, And I feel like Florentino Perez still would want to christen the new Bernabeu with uh, Mbappe in it, but if he was to, to eventually make the move to Madrid, it would be on uh, Florentino's terms. It wouldn't be on, you know, Mbappe's camp wouldn't have a lot of leeway anymore in negotiating. Does his antics maybe dissuade you a bit from that move? Because this Real Madrid team right now, they're a team that works for each other. 
there isn't a real like although Benzema is possibly going to win the Ballon d'Or on Monday there isn't a real like standout like guy who's like heads and shoulders no one is playing for a specific person Mm -hmm. but it seems like Mbappe would want that now I think if he was to come to Madrid he would be not necessarily that he would be tamed but I feel like he would be humbled in the same way that uh, Neymar had to tuck his tail in during the MSN days uh, alongside Messi and Suarez. I think if Mbappe was to come to Madrid and uh, we still had Benzema in the locker room so that some of the other senior players, David Alaba, all these players, I think he would he would calm down. He would still have you know a little bit of ego here and there, but I think he would put that aside for the, the greater good of the team. But when Benzema and everyone else leave then and he becomes the quote-unquote leader of the team, then there may be a problem. Yeah. But a, a front three of Rodrigo, Mbappe, and Vinicius. Woof. <laughs> That's scary. It was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as a media sign in, it would make a lot of sense because he has the quality. The guy is like possibly the most marketable brand of the young stars coming up in football. Is like on the cover of FIFA. Like he's such a marketable player. Yeah, he's very marketable. And he's actually like a very good, like, He's got a good head on his shoulders. Like, up until recently with the whole contract thing and everything, he never really showed the side of him when he was at Monaco. Seems like he's, you know, really focused and is able to keep the drama away. But again, we'll see how that develops in terms of his character uh, with time. Oscar, on PSG, uh, like, you've seen most of the, some of the games. You've seen some <clears throat> in the Champions League. How would you rate... Um, where they are this season compared to last season, are they susceptible to the same shocks that they've ha- that's happened to them throughout their history in the Champions League? For that, we'll have to see. Because it's usually not in the group stage that they have those shocks. I do think overall, like, it's, be- it's better from them. Like, the manager has more of a presence in the dressing room than previous managers. He has more control of things. Their formation and setup is more solid than last year's. And I'll say, though, that while they might not win the Champions League this year, I don't think, um, I don't think like the necessary problems that they used to have last year would be the reason why they get knocked out. I feel if they get knocked out, it's because they just got unlucky instead of pressing the self-destruct button. Because Galtier really has a good grip on the dressing room from what I've seen. Yeah. Taps, do you think is going to be the same old PSG again in the last 16 or quarterfinals? No, I think they're going to they're gonna have learned from what happened last year. And I think uh, Galtier is actually a good coach to yeah. be able to navigate things. Uh, like Oscar mentioned, if they do get undone, I don't think it'll necessarily be because of them collapsing. It'll just have to be an opponent that outplays them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel another thing that has really helped PSG is the fact that Neymar, Messi, and Mbappe are actually like a genuine front three. Now, instead of last season where it was maybe two of them for long periods and another person was injured or off form or whatever. So I feel like that front three has grown together this season. And that if PSG are to have success in Europe, that front three would be the huge factor. Yeah. And finally, the Ballon d'Or, it's going to go to Benzema, right? Or is there any last-minute surprises? No, there's, there's no debate. No debate. <laughs> there's no debate. Oscar, no debate? I don't want to talk about the Ballon d'Or, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, Benzema has been the best player this year. He deserves it. The, usually, the Ballon d'Or winner, I'm usually fine with that. It's... 2 to 30, the list, the ranking of 2 to 30 that really makes my blood boil. But the good thing is that I just found out on the pod that the award is on Monday. So I'm doing a good job avoiding all these things. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, mean, I'm definitely not going to be on Twitter after because I don't want to see stupid takes on Barcelona either side of the argument. So whatever happens, happens. And Benzema, congrats on win the Ballon d'Or, it's a great achievement for him, honestly. Yeah, I agree. Given, given where his Real Madrid career was some time ago, but he's really grown and yeah. he's a wonderful player. The leadership he showed last season, like mm-hmm. the amount of times he was able to just drag us out of the dirt 
Yeah. Um, of course, that's not even like taking away credit from what Courtois had to do, Rodrigo, all these yeah. players, but yeah. it all started and ended with Benzema. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I hate Real Madrid, but seeing Courtois, <laughs> any team below the top three is actually going to make my blood boil. So it's best <laughs> I don't even pay attention. Yeah, I was going to say that as well. Like, he deserves to be at least fourth in the Ballon d'Or ranking. Cause mm-hmm. he's been... I don't think he'll get his flowers, though. Cause like, They're going to people... give him his son or someone will be above yeah. him. And no disrespect like... to him. Why Tottenham, why Tottenham players on the list? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, can I rant about this? <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> These are words are so stupid. Like, the way they voted for is stupid. It's a blue... <laughs> okay, look at it, right? Let's take Messi, for instance. Who does Messi? Who did Messi vote for last year? Neymar, Mbappe. And for young player, I think he voted Pedro and Nuno Mendes. I'm like, well, some of those picks, well, Neymar is controversial, but like you can clearly see there's a pattern. People <laughs> voting for their friends. It's just it's basically like the Oscars, you see. It's just a bunch <laughs> of people. Contest, yeah. It's a popularity contest, but it's not as obnoxious as the Oscars because I actually like football. <laughs> but still, like the whole, I feel like all these bound arguments are just completely unnecessary. Like, yeah. Personally, for me, I feel like st- awards that you earn through your ability are the best ones, like the Golden Shoe or the Golden Glove or the Zamora or Most Assists or something. Anything that has to do with voting, honestly, especially for the ranking of second to 30, I'm like, who does this? <laughs> How can someone in their right conscience this year say Harry Kane was better than he wasn't even the best player on his team this year? So why would you keep put, it, put yeah. him first? Did you know the worst one was when Kier <laughs> found his way into the top 30 best players in the world? Well, come again. Simon Kier found his way into the top 30 best players. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we know I did, did that one. And <laughs> to be honest, there's a sporting reason that can make it make a little sense because yeah, Milan, it was actually Milan's Milan Milan got into the top for that year. Yeah. But I mean, the fact that even if he's there, why are Bonucci and Chiellini way ahead of him when Bonucci and Chiellini <laughs> besides the U? I mean, we know they play for you. So I'm like, yeah, I don't get this list. Like the short term reason the like Sterling was Man City's best pace player on the list last year when he barely played. <laughs> like who writes this nonsense? Even I'll say it now, Messi winning ahead of one. Just I get the reason, but still it's like if you're including the second half of the later part of the year, he should have dropped off from first to second. Uh, it was all Cup America. So. That was Cup America. I, I mean, I get it's an emotional thing and I mean, as someone who loves Messi, I'm not mad about it, but I can call an injustice when it's an injustice. Where were you last year, bro? Where were you last year? Last, 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 year, <laughs> last year was different. Last year was different. Listen, listen. listen last year, I just said, uh, congrats, Messi, and kept quiet. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I say, I, I wasn't out there advocating why you should have went. I was just like, yeah, I, right. say, I think I have to agree with the same, like, the individual awards. I don't really see the purpose of them. Like, sure, they're there. They're good to be won and everything. Like uh, that, but I think... The purpose is pretty easy. <laughs> Let's get people talk about it. Yeah. And ultimately, that leads to money somehow. The debates. Uh, I think ultimately, like, even if you just had a good season and you know it yourself, your flowers will eventually be um, You don't yeah. need, like, yeah. an award to tell you that you were yeah. the best. That kind of thing. I feel yeah. like... You you should just sort of know it, and your peers will give you those flowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I feel you need social media to give you mm-hmm. those flowers. Yeah, I feel yeah. like everyone that wins, like Benzema, is definitely going to cherish the La Liga, the UEFA, the Champions League, the Super Cup more than. I mean, it's his first time, but when you look at it, it's like ah, these are the ones I really fought hard for and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think even Benz himself, I don't think he'll necessarily care about it too much. I think for exactly. him, it'll, it'll more so just be a vindication because of like mm-hmm. the time that he went through. Like you're mm-hmm. mentioning, there yeah. was a time where Madridistas wanted Morata to play over. over <laughs> <Benzema>. <laughs> <laughs> he, they wanted a Higuain, even even as far as like 2019-20 when Jovic came in. Yeah. And they were like, 
pro Jovic fans who got pissed off when whatever Benzema didn't come up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. for everything that he went through, it's just it's like a vill- it's icing on the cake to the Benzema. Yeah. Very very successful yet. Yeah, yeah, it's and I feel like a lot of these awards for the players is just like opportunity to like get together, rub shoulders, like mm-hmm. for them to like relax, get their hair down. Benz is dropping a music video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> uh, m- maybe you can do a combo with Memphis or something. <laughs> I don't think Memphis should. I don't think that'll be wise. I and mean, he's in, he's injured. He's not part of the current mess, but that yeah. wouldn't look good. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, now we're talking about music videos. It's a good sign. It's time to close out the podcast. Thank you so much, Taps, for coming on. Oscar, as always. See you. Thank next you week. very much. No worries. Thank yeah. you. See you next week. Thank you. And guys, adios and vamos. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>